welcome to our monthly member webinar that we co-host with Mobile Must Have. Eric is joining me today, and I am Sheree, one of your co-founders at the Mobile Internet Resource Center. This is a exclusive webinar for our members. However, this month we will be opening up the archive to the public. So welcome if you are joining us here at the Mobile Internet Resource Center and Mobile Must Have. The topic that we will be accomplishing today is talking about the different ways that a peplink router can help you improve your cellular data performance. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, friend, and business partner, Eric. <laughs> Hi, Cherie. Yes, this is Eric from Mobile Must Have. I almost said Mobile Internet Resource Center because we spend so much time together. <laughs> oh, and uh, Siri says hi as well. So thanks so much for having us. So we are building this content to build out our mutually created Peplink Resource Center with a whole bunch of topics. And this webinar is going to be a higher level overview that will be linking to past content and webinars that we have done deeper on each of these topics. So the first thing that I wanna introduce you to, of course, is a Peplink router. This is a uh, Max Transit Pro. It has two LTE modems inside of it. And these Peplink routers, whatever model that you have chosen, gives you a lot of features that help you get a better cellular signal and performance and reliability that other options like a mobile hotspot device, a smartphone or a tablet might not be able to give you. And we're gonna be going down, we have four different topics that we'll be covering this afternoon. We'll be talking about antennas, we'll be talking about cellular boosters, we'll be talking about cellular band selection and multi-WAN abilities and how to optimize those. Uh, to get started, let's talk about antennas. So <laughs> there's quite a few there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So shipped from Peplink when you get this, uh, whether you've purchased it from Mobile Must Have or another vendor, uh, it will come with a paddle antenna for each of the antenna ports. And these just screw on at the back of the antenna port. And what I really love about routers in particular and the Peplink routers as well is that they do screw off. And you have SMA antenna ports, and they do have a little bit of a problem if you don't have them screwed in exactly right yeah. and staying up. Now, these little paddle antennas, they are well optimized for getting a great signal. Um, if you are in an RV or a boat that doesn't, isn't made of metal and isn't blocking signal, you may find these work just fine. In your experience, Eric, is we use them like this Ab a lot. Absolutely. So I... I think Caitlin, who's one of our sort of senior nomadic specialists, was operating her peplink and working from the road full time for over a year just with the paddle antennas, traveling all around, had great results. Um, but when she moved to a what we'll talk about next, the mobility antenna, she didn't know what she didn't know and was very happy with the performance. But compared to a cell phone or a MiFi hotspot, the two decibel uh, gain antennas that come with it is it it can equate to roughly a hundred percent more cell signal than a than no decibel gain. So it, it does make and, a big difference. And it's important to know, unlike a mobile hotspot or a smartphone, you need to have some sort of external antenna attached to the router because there is no internal antenna inside of the router. So if you don't have something attached to this, you're not going to be getting any cellular data performance. So these do work great. Uh, we typically will leave one set of these inside of our boat and one set attached to an external antenna. Um, so you can unscrew all of these and then you can use external antennas to attach to that. So here I have Peplink's marine antenna. This is a four by four antenna. There's actually four cellular antennas inside of this. It's a about the size to think about above a baseball bat. This is a really, really huge antenna, a design for marine use for RV use. You're probably gonna to wanna to go something a little smaller because this beast. It doubles for self-defense, which is nice. You know? But it's the only one I have conveniently available because everything else is installed on our van out in the parking lot. But when you install them, they have the antenna leads. These are SMA connectors that are designed to go directly into. So you would just unscrew these paddle antennas and screw these in and you can use an external antenna. Now, there are a lot of different choices for antennas. And um, you wanna go over, Eric, some of the, the kind of general options that are out there? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, well, there's quite a few brands, but before I hop into that, um, a, a common question for folks is the kind of, what is this one X one or one by one? What is this two X two or two by two and four by four? and 
what are the flavors and what do these really mean? So I think that's a duo that you have there. This is a that... duo. So inside of this router, there are two modems. Each of them are LTE mid-range modems that each only have two antennas. So here is actually these two antennas are going to modem one. These two antennas are going to modem two. Mm -hmm. And that can be so tricky because if you are looking at a category, a higher category modem, like a category 18 or a 20, it would look virtually identical on the back with those same four antennas, but they would all be dedicated to a single modem in the device rather than two independent modems. So there's... Um, just because we're trying to do some high level overview, I would a, a quick reference guide is if it's a category 12 or, or under, um, it's typically one or two antennas, usually two these days. It's pretty hard to find something with one. Um, and if it's a category, I, I, I don't know if there's much above between 12 and 18 that's common right now, maybe a 16. I remember those, but that's some typically... 16s are out there. But yeah, typically we're seeing right now, uh, Cat 20 is about the only one you're selling new, but you might have an old Cat 18. Yeah. So then you'll have four for that. So when you look at the antenna, uh, make sure you're selecting a flavor that's compatible with what mobile router you're looking at. Now, it can get a little tricky if you have a modem like this, I'm sorry, a router like this with two modems, because you can actually use one single four by four uh, antenna and it can connect to both of the modems there. And basically you'll be splitting that roof antenna across the two modems. Um, the vast majority of manufacturers will support that configuration, uh, but make sure you double check the documentation because some might not, but most of them do. Right, and most of them will have recommendations of which antennas inside of the structure are ideal for going to the same modem. That might be how they're positioned inside of the dome, or in this case, this large baseball bat-like shape. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, popular antennas, I'd say if we're going into the... Um, the four by four is the Mobility 42 from Peplink. That's a very, very solid performing antenna that's at a, a pretty aggressive price point. Um, it, it, you get a lot of bang for your buck there. And, and, um, and then Parsec is another company that we we like, made in America, really high performance antenna has, has tracked really well on the four by four side. The Parsec Husky is a very popular option, but quite a bit pricier. Um, the folks that like it, love it and uh, are willing to pay that. But just, you know, from a budget perspective, unless you're hopping really out into the fringe areas, typically the mobility does pretty well as well. Right, we keep the mobility on our van because it's smaller, doesn't take up as much footprint on it. Uh, what we like about an omnidirectional antenna, and these, both of those ones that Eric just covered are dome style antennas, multi-purpose antennas. They usually have four cellular antennas inside. I think Husky, the Parsec now has a, one with eight inside of it to go with a dual four by four modem setup, which would be like uh, the dual 5G BR2 that is out. Uh, but these are all ones, they also might have Wi-Fi antennas inside of it. So you can hook them up to the Wi-Fi ports of your router as well to use Wi-Fi as WAN or to transmit your Wi-Fi network on. And then usually will have a GPS antenna inside of them. Now, what we like about these omnidirectional, always on mounted, always on top of your RV or boat uh, setup is there's no aiming. There's no setup really involved once you do the installation. So you pretty much can use them while you're in motion. You can use them as soon as you get parked, you're going to be online with the best signal that it can get. Now, there are other antenna types that require a little bit of setup. Uh, you might know like the uh, the panel antennas. Uh, one that Chris and I like a lot is the Akita by uh, Parsec. And that one is a big flat thing that is would be very difficult to leave up while in motion because it's going to be a big windscreen as you're moving down the road. So it's one that we actually deploy on a pole only when we need it. So we rely on our always on omnidirectional antenna. We deploy the higher gain Akita panel antenna only when we're getting a weak signal. Mm -hmm. Then there's also- And that Akita is, oh, I know the Akita really confuses people because it looks directional, but it's omni, but you covered that exactly. People will look at that and I'm like, well, I wouldn't drive with it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are bridges uh, to be careful of, but um, but yes, then you have your directional antennas um, uh, pointing the X-Pole series, very popular at an aggressive price point. Um, and those can really dial up the, the signal strength that you can receive. But in order to dial up the signal strength, it's like they're focusing a lens. They're focusing in on a very small area that you have to point the antenna at. So um, 
it's like a laser focused beam towards the cell tower. But uh, most people come up to us and go, how do I point this? And I say, well, we actually have a video for that at the Mobile Internet Resource Center. Let's well, here, yes. give them a guide to that. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if you're lazy like me, um, a directional antenna, we don't even carry one with us anymore because they require so much precise aiming. And it's really only going to give you a sizable advantage if you're far away from a cellular tower. Most of the time, I prefer an omnidirectional higher gain antenna. And if we can't do something with that, then yeah, a directional antenna might be able to do it, but you're going to need one that's got multiple antennas on it. And then you're going to be spending a lot of time out there precisely aiming it every 15 degrees and doing speed tests and performance tests just to see if you're actually gaining anything. We use the yeah. A lot of people do carry the directional antennas. It's nice in a pinch. Um, we'll talk about boosters and some other things you can use in a pinch that might get you similar uh, benefits when you're really out on the fringe. Um, some of our, I'd say rural home use, big for panels, people that aren't moving. Um, and one that's come up recently is folks that are traveling or near the border, either Mexico or Canada, where they're pinging across to the wrong towers and they're getting forced into roaming and they're struggling with that a little bit. Some of that can be solved with band selection, which we're going to cover in a little bit, but directional antennas can help you point to a tower that you prefer for one reason or another. I know that helped me a lot when I was in Quartzsite where a number of towers I was connecting to that were more powerful and closer had no bandwidth. So I was able to- So many that. RVers there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, how about that one way over there? And I was able to get great speeds um, by dialing in that way. So there are benefits, but you're, it's, you know, people who want to travel with the panel as their primary, I'm like, that's, you're signing up for a lot of work. <laughs> right. I mean, every time you stop, you've got to get it out, deploy it and, and set it up precisely for that location. So we advise going with an omnidirectional antenna as you're always on solution or just sticking with the paddle antennas that come with your pep link and consider a panel antenna or a directional antenna to be your specialty things, like kind of assembling a golf club collection. Mm -hmm. You got your specialty putters and then you've got, I don't play golf, so I'm making all that up, but <laughs> you do want, you have your always use, always multi-purpose option and then have the specialty case ones if you find you need them. Um, yeah, insert one other quick one that I wanted to mention um, was also uh, the window mount options that are becoming somewhat popular for folks that maybe are in like an Airstream or something where they are struggling with an, a metal exterior and they don't wanna take the plunge to necessarily drill a hole in the roof yet or run wires out a window for a temporary solution. Um, the Parsec Falcon, the Netgear, I'm not sure the name of the Netgear, we don't sell Netgear it. Memo. Mimo. The Netco Mimo, um, really cool solid options that can kind of be a, blend, a, a step up from a two decibel paddle that's not you don't necessarily want to put your mobile router in the sun by the window, but if you have a small antenna that can go window mount, that can add a lot of benefit as well if you're if you're looking to step it up. And it's very those are also really inexpensive um, and they're portable. So um, we have some folks that get the window as well and then use it in hotel rooms when they're traveling with their mobile routers and stuff like that. Right. So, right. so you may find you need uh, multiple antennas for different situations, but also look at what's convenient for you to install in your setup. You know, you want to also pay attention to your cable links. Longer cables lead to more signal loss. The more connectors you have to use leads to more signal loss. You can follow up. We have a full guide to selecting cellular antennas, rvmobileinternet.com slash cellular antennas. And that guide will go over a whole bunch more about the specifications of an antenna, the styles that they come in. And we have some in-depth member videos there that we've done with Merck's own antenna guru, Andy Hull going really deep into looking inside the antennas and what makes them do what they do. I was surprised how much when he taught me that. <laughs> uh, all right, now moving on to cellular boosters. You know, so this is the WeBoost Reach. This is our topic, cellular booster, after extensive in the field testing with a whole bunch of other ones. Um, it comes with an exterior antenna that you would mount on the top of your RV or boat. And then you have an interior antenna. It might be this style, or it might be uh, one that looks like a little desktop puck. Um, and basically anything, this takes one single antenna, goes through this amplifier, amplifies the signal, and retransmits it out your interior antenna. And then everything that is in range of this interior antenna gets a cellular boost out of it. Sounds like a great concept. 
and you would think for the $500 price point, it should this give you phenomenal performance. Um, not necessarily so with data. There are a lot of downsides with cellular boosters, and we cover that in our guide to boosters. But one of them is because you're only taking a single signal, you're not getting the benefits of MIMO, which is using those multiple antennas. You're just taking one signal and broadcasting it, amplifying it. It's like putting it in a megaphone and shouting it, which means any background signal noise that is being picked up between you and the tower, and there's a lot of it out there, is also being amplified. And you're losing that benefit of the multiple antennas. Another downside of boosters, is they only cover about six cellular frequency bands and the carriers have in play over 15 now at this point. So you're, you're they're not going to be an all-purpose thing. Like for T-Mobile, uh, they're virtually useless. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and it's not the it's not the booster company's fault necessarily. It's the technology and its regulations with the FCC that say that they can only boost those certain bands. Um, but yeah, when you know covering antennas, we talk about four antennas for one modem, and then oftentimes each individual antenna has multiple streams inside that single antenna. So as you get your category modems up, category twenty, start playing around with five G, you have potentially eight simultaneous connections to this cell tower and a booster is one. So that can, you know, people are like, I have this booster, it's, I have full bars, I'm getting eight megabits download. I'm like, turn off the booster. Oh, wait, that's better now? What, uh -huh. What's going on? Yeah, so most situations, and we used to say it was about 70 to 80% of the time, you're gonna better luck with using an external antenna attached to your, your router or hotspot or whatever you're using. I would say it's, probably down to 95, 90% that just could be better. And that's just because most of the cellular towers at this time have been upgraded to transmit at least four by four and, and communicate with four antennas at once. So most of the time having that external antenna is going to be better. But in some cases, when you are very far from the cellular tower and that amplification actually is better than having multiple antennas, or if you're needing to optimize your upload speeds, because Upload speeds, the transmit power inside of your, your router is a lot less than the transmit power that is on the cellular tower. So by putting that megaphone in front of the booster, you're, you're basically being able to shout further away to a further uh, tower, and that's going to give you better performance on upload. So if you're needing to broadcast, you're, um, you're finding your upload speeds are just horrendous, which can impact your overall performance, even though you might be getting good download speeds. That's when a booster might actually help mm -hmm. if you're not able to get what you need done with the external antennas. So when... Yeah. So how do you, if you decide to have a booster, just remember you're having a $500 investment for something you might use 5% of the time or less. Um, if you decide to have one, and Chris and I do carry one because it comes in handy just often enough, is how do you best use it with a booster? I mean, sorry, a cellular router. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you're using an external antenna, it's up on your roof and here you have this internal antenna. So first thing you want to do is disconnect your external antenna Put these paddles back on. So you got some setup here. And then place this internal antenna nearby, all four of these antenna or two antenna, how many ever antennas you have. And then the router should be able to pick up that amplified signal off the booster. Yeah, and nearby is really the key word there. You'll see a drop off from, you know, when you're in a real fringe area, that booster, if configured properly, you might see two possibly three additional bars come onto the peplink router, really massive improvement. Uh, you move it two feet away from the router and it'll drop off like a, like a mm -hmm. stone in water. It's, people are like, the box says it covers 4,000 square feet. I'm like, no way. <laughs> I mean, it will pick up a minuscule, minuscule amount of signal. But yeah, if you're configuring or planning on using a booster, we say like within 12 inches is really... Yeah. How close or even, even less. If you're in a situation where you need a cellular booster because it's the only way you're going to be able to get online, then you're talking inches of what it's yeah. able to transmit. <laughs> so yeah. we typically I mean, like bungee cord it on right here. <laughs> yeah, you know where I see, I mean, it's a little off topic, but I'll be brief. Boosters in vehicles 
where you're on the phone, hands-free. I love boosters, especially if you have a late model car, they're starting to put in this fancy glass that reflects all the heat. It has metal in the glass and it destroys cell phone signal. So if you have your, you know, you're pulling a fifth wheel and you are working and you're doing work calls and you're in the vehicle, a booster can be a huge benefit for that type of use. It's just really more on the voice side than the data side. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Boosters are really great for voice calls. Uh, data, they're not as busy as that MIMO technology. You're not necessarily, you might even see, like Eric said before, is if you're using a booster versus not using a booster, you may see a decrease in your download performance just because of your that single antenna signal versus the multiple. So uh, do follow up with our booster guide, uh, rvmobileinternet.com slash boosters. We go into a lot more depth on the boosters out there, the technology, how to use them, how to install them, um, and how to select the right one for you. Oh, you know, another great guide to that point, your guide on signal strength and understanding the signal strength meter and understanding signal to noise ratio and all these things, because that can actually show you how the booster may be giving you one aspect of signal, but actually creating a lot of noise that could attribute to the problem. That's a great guide that that uh, has helped a lot of Peplink users out just to know how to read those numbers and right. So anytime, what they mean. yeah, that's a great point because anytime that you, how do you know if what your the antennas you're using, the boosters your antenna that you're getting better performance? So refer to our testing guide is the one that Eric's referring to. RVMobileInternet.com/testing uh, goes over how to use the speed test apps that are out there, how to read the readings, and some of the benchmarks for the speeds that you want to get to do things like whether you're streaming Netflix or doing a webinar like this, or just surfing the web, we've got the, the current recommended benchmarks that you're aiming for, for minimal speeds for download upload, as well as latency, uh, which are all important components. And we have a video there that uh, will go further into those components. Now, the, the next topic that a, a Peplink router gives you is something called cellular band selection. And uh, what's important to know is that the modem inside of your cellular device and the tower that you're talking to kind of do this dance, a negotiation, picking which cellular frequencies are the best ones that they think they want to put you on, which may not be the cellular frequencies you want to be on. Um, so Peplink has in their user interface a way to go in and turn off different cellular bands and trying to target the cellular bands that you want to try. Now, there's no fast and easy way. There's no like, oh, go try band 13 and band seven. It's always going to work best in every location. Every location, every tower broadcasts different frequency bands. And what works best in one area, the next one might not. You might find band 13 is saturated oh. when you're in one area, but band five isn't. And then it could be completely different the next place. Yeah. And not even location. It might be time of day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the reason why the tower oftentimes will put you on certain bands because it is a broader band, meaning it has more ability, it has, it has more room for more customers. We'll put it that way. And it also, uh, you know, may mean they don't want to necessarily put you on some of the, the other bands that might actually at certain times a day be really open and faster. So, right. um, yeah, I can share with you. Yeah, yeah. Once you take over the screen and, and show the Peplink thing, we do have a full guide that goes into this that uh, Eric and Chris did earlier this year, going over some methods for selecting bands and the different ways to approach this. Yeah, we'll just keep it uh, very high level for a second. Oop, did I share my whole screen? Well, that works. Can you guys see that screen? Yeah, I see it. Screen. I see your whole screen. There's, okay, there's cool. this checking account number. And <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. And I was supposed to spare an app, but you guys, well, I use a Mac. That was a hidden secret. All right. So if you're on a Peplink dashboard, um, which uh, is covered in another basic guide for Peplink, but let's assume you know how to get into your standard management console. You'll have your cellular connections and you can click on the details tab here, which will bring up the cellular details page. Now, something to note is the band that you're connected to. So in this case, uh, we're on band 14 uh, and it does not look like we're on standard LTE. You may see that there's more than one band listed here if you have a category six or, you know, you have a LTE advanced modem. So category 12 kind of up. You may see more than one band here, but that will tell you what you're connected to under this band section. If you scroll down to 
um, this section here, you'll see band selection. If you hit custom, it's going to bring you up a big list of the bands that are supported by your particular modem that you've brought up the settings for. Um, we go into this a ton in that guide that we covered, so we won't dive deep into this, but um, I find the, we'll, we'll just cover a brief one. I find the easiest one uh, to use for band selection is called, what Chris refers to as the elimination diet. Um, so I will just uncheck the band I'm connected to. So in this case, it would be band 14 and then scroll to the bottom and click save and apply. I usually have a notebook next to me or a notepad open and I will run a speed test um, on the band I'm on 14 first, then I'll uncheck it, click save, wait about 20, 30 seconds, it will connect to a different band. And then I'll run the test again. And then I'll keep eliminating until I find the band that is the fastest, or I'll typically just stop if the second one is meeting uh, my speed requirements and I wanna get on with my life. But that's uh, a quick and easy way to do uh, band selection. That came in really handy last year um, in, in the Lake Havasu area where we had a, I think there was a tower issue or something where I don't know, fiber was cut or something, but we had full connection to this tower that we just were getting broadcasted to because it was so heavily available, um, but it had no bandwidth on it. So um, by unselecting the bands that we were connected to, we connected to something where we only had one or two bars and the speeds were great. Um, so it, it can come in handy. All right, so if you would like to dive more into cellular band selection. We have a full resource guide on the topic. This was an archive of a webinar that uh, Eric and Chris did diving really deep. We have three different approaches. You have the elimination diet. We have like a fast ranger or something. I don't know, Chris yeah, named- Elimination diet, the one band at a time and the long ranger. Right, so there's different approaches you can take. Uh, there is, like I said, no easy one size fits all like, oh, just go select these bands and you're good. It is going to vary by your location and the carrier that you're using in that location. And as Eric said, time of day, because you know when everyone's using the internet, things go down and you might want to go try to find a less congested band. But that is a great feature that Peplink offers to allow you to have some control over your cellular performance right at the frequency band level. Um, you're not going to find that in hotspot devices. I think some other routers have it, um, but that's a pretty uh, cool feature that Peplink offers. Yeah. And uh, one note before we wrap that up is put a post-it or something on your steering wheel or your window or wherever you're going to remember to re-enable those bands before you hit the road. Uh, that's our most, I don't know, this thing was working great. I was having a great time. I moved. It's not working. I'm unhappy. And we, did you turn on band, the uh, band, did you use band selection? Oh yeah, I did. Okay. Well, we got to re-enable those bands. So make sure you don't forget that. It's right. actually what I used, the little tape, the Peplink tape that came with the router. I use this and I, it around the steering wheel and it's one of my uh instead of using it for cable management it's my reminder to turn back on my bands <laughs> <laughs> yes because it will change at your next location what works best and it's yep. always best to start with everything enabled and let the modem do that negotiation with the tower because a lot of time it will do a decent job and get you online with the connectivity you need you only want to go into band selection if you're having issues and you haven't had, uh, you know, using antennas and other antennas you've deployed and maybe a booster if those haven't worked yet, then go into cellular band selection because it's going to be a lot of trial and error to get something to work there. But at least it's trial and error you can do at your desk instead of standing outside pointing an antenna. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so the, the next topic that we wanted to cover that a Peplink allows you to do is it has the ability to use so many different internet connections and bring them together in different ways. Depending upon the model that you select, you might have multiple cellular modems inside of it. So you could have multiple cellular carriers. So this one has two modems inside. So maybe I might have T-Mobile and Verizon on this one. You also usually have at least one ethernet port that is enabled as a WAN source. So you can plug something in, maybe it's Starlink, maybe it's a T-Mobile home internet, maybe it is a, a, a mobile hotspot device that has an ether, ethernet out, like some of the Night, Nick or Nighthawk mobile hotspot devices. You also can use Wi-Fi as WAN. So you can use the Wi-Fi antenna on this to pick up a Wi-Fi signal that might be offered maybe by your campground, your marina, a library, or somewhere else that you're visiting to bring in a Wi-Fi source. It could also be one of your other devices, maybe picking up your 
your smartphone's Wi-Fi signal if you use a hotspot off of it or one off of another device. Some even offer, and we tr keep pressing them to try to do more, might also offer a USB port for tethering to hotspot devices that don't have Ethernet out. So some devices like the Max BR2 that we love, Pro, that one has seven options for having different internet sources that come together. This one has two antennas, it has one ethernet port, and Wi-Fi is WAN on two different radios. So this one can have up to five different internet sources coming into it at once, which gives you the ability to juggle all of these options, bringing them together, trying different ones, and even using them at the same time. And uh, I'm going to let Eric take over from here and go over the four different ways in which you can use these multiple WAN options. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 so uh, many different ways to connect, but I, I just, I think that a lot of folks hop into the world of Peplink or, or routers that have multi-WAN capabilities, and they, they sort of stop because it works really well with a single connection, or maybe they have multiple connections and they they don't really use it to its maximum potential. So I think it's really a uh, a feature worth spending some time on if you're if you're if you've had your peplink for a while and maybe you were worried uh, about getting too deep and now you're ready. So um, a couple different ways there is, uh, are to connect. One is referred to as load balancing. So you can essentially connect. You can have multiple connections dragged into uh, priority one of your management console. And I'm actually gonna share one that is not common to what we normally see, but it's a very unique situation for me. So I wanted to share it with folks. I have zero cell signal where I am. And that very rarely happens. I'm operating this entire call on Wi-Fi WAN, which uh, most of the time we've kind of referred to campground Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi is like the worst possible way to connect. Um, I'm able to connect right now. I've disabled Starlink as a as a risky test, but it seems to be going pretty well. So we'll we'll uh, show you kind of how it works. But specific to the different options, load balancing simply means that you have more than one connection dragged into this priority one, and you have two, one or more green lights saying they're available. What the router will do by default is it'll essentially try to balance the traffic of your devices across whatever connections are enabled. Um, so that can cause some problems we'll get into, but uh, basically your devices are gonna go out uh, one connection or the other, whatever's enabled. Um, the next way that uh, you can go and connect to multiple WAN sources is uh, through um, a SD-WAN bonding solution called Speed Fusion or Speed Fusion Connect. And that's probably the most common way or the most reliable way to utilize a Peplink router. Most of the routers will come with uh, a, with, a, with the ability to connect to the Speed Fusion uh, Cloud or Speed Fusion Connect service. And what that does is it creates a VPN or a tunnel between you and a Peplink data center. And that tunnel allows you to combine multiple connections at the same time. And we've actually got a, a, a detailed webinar and guide on how to configure Speed Fusion and how that operates and what some of the pros and cons are uh, for how that uh, can be enabled. Um, and what am I forgetting? I know we wanted to cover WAN smoothing and failover. Just, Do we want yeah. to talk about failover? Yeah, so failover is just basically one connection goes down and you're allowing the router to select the next best connection. And a lot of people think that's a really you know, something they're going to rely on a lot, but usually you as the person surfing the web or hosting a webinar is going to notice that your connection is becoming unstable long before the router has detected it. So you're probably going to want to not necessarily rely on that and use something more like uh, the speed fusion usually is that. Yeah, I mean, so I use failover uh, typically, like let's say I'm parking the RV and I'm gonna be away from the RV. I have cellular enabled in my primary, but I'll leave the Wi-Fi WAN connected to the campground Wi-Fi and standby. So if something happened to the cellular plans, which could be something as simple as I run out of data, like maybe I have a hard stop cap on my data plan and it shuts off if I hit a certain number of gigs, um, or there's an issue with the cell tower or the modem, goes offline or whatever, essentially anything that's showing in yellow, which would be a secondary priority, will take over if all of your greens disappear in priority one. So that's failover. So it's, but yeah, not something I'd rely on for 
work, <laughs> but right. it's there for for when needed. And then uh, WAN smoothing is kind of going over all the options at once on separate streams using all your data. <laughs> yeah, WAN smoothing is an interesting one. So speed fusion will combine multiple tunnels together. Um, it's also known as if you get out of like speed fusion is like the uh, the patented word that Heplink uses. But if you go broader to the actual technology, it would be referred to as SD WAN, and that's bond. You know the the way that it's using the technology to to connect multiple internet connections together. Um, inside of the SD WAN is a technology called WAN smoothing, and what that does is it says, hey you're communicating all this information across these two internet tunnels. And it's basically balancing them by default. When you enable WAN smoothing, it's saying, hey, send an extra backup copy of all of the data down both tunnels at the same time. So that if there's an issue, because you're connecting wirelessly to the cell tower, so if something kills the packet in the air, or if another issue causes one of the packets to be lost, which is when you get the uh, uh, video, <laughs> um, you have a duplicate backup packet on the other internet connection. Uh, so WAN smoothing is a fun uh, sort of deeper dive uh, topic that can bolster how your speed fusion tunnel works. Really, uh, the downside to WAN smoothing is it will use double your band your uh your your gigabytes on your data plan so if you've got you know you'll basically be sending the same stuff out both connections so you'll use double the bandwidth the upside is you've got redundancy mm -hmm. all right you want to go ahead and uh, stop the screen share and we'll get this wrapped up and then take some questions so that gives you an go. overview of four different ways that a peplink router can help you optimize your cellular data performance so think about your antennas if you want a booster in your setup using cellular band selection, and then how you can best optimize your multiple internet connections. If you use the guide that goes along with this video archive, we have links to all of our further in-depth content on all of these topics, so you can dive in as you're ready in exploring each of these. And a lot of us find that it's some combination of any of these at any location that might be able to give you the best performance and reliability at any particular location that you're in. Um, I want to thank Eric for joining us on this webinar. Uh, check out all the resources over at Mobile Must Have. Uh, if you're not currently a member and watching this video, a lot of our content is made possible by our premium members, our mobile internet aficionados. Um, and for that, they get a lot of our deeper content as an exclusive benefit. So if this is a topic you're interested in and you want to go further, consider becoming a member either through Mobile Must Have's Explore membership that you can purchase through them. Or if you're not quite sure, if uh, mobile must-have solutions are for you. We do offer the MIA membership direct with us, and then you can always upgrade to MIA uh, to the, the Explore membership directly with mobile must-have when you're ready to purchase and get additional discounts that Eric offers all of our members. And then they also do offer, if you have questions, follow up in our member forums. The mobile must-have team does offer a tech support and configuration forum specifically for all of our members, whether you're a mobile must-have member or just direct MIA follow up with questions there that you might have. At this point, I'm gonna turn off the recording and then we'll go ahead and take questions from those that are in the live recording with us. These videos are brought to you by our premium members, our mobile internet aficionados. They make it possible for us to track this news and create these videos. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, or better yet, consider becoming a member yourself.